We'll continue our worship by reading our two scriptures for this morning. The first scripture comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that has been given to us. The word of God for the people of God. And would you stand for our gospel reading? The gospel reading comes from John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Can I help you with something? Well, hi. Hi, my name is Jill. I, I tell the to stories here. Uh, is there something I can help you with? Well, my name's Confused. Confused? Well, that's an unusual name. Well, it's not so unusual. I hear people saying I'm confused all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. Those people aren't saying that their name is confused. They are saying that they are confused. Uh, you lost me. Well, never mind. It's not important. Confused? How can I help you? Well, I'm here to worship. I heard this was the place to be. I went out and bought me a big Bible and everything. All I need now is to know who to worship. Okay, well you are in the right place. The key players get honor and praise around here. Well, who are they? Okay, well listen closely. Uh, there is God. Uh, one God, that, that sounds easy enough. What do you call this God? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, now just wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said there was only one. Right, there is one. So which one? Which what? Which name? The name I gave you. You gave me three. That's right. What's right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So you worship three gods? No, one. So which is it? Which is what? Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes what? That's God's name. Which God? Our God. <laughs> Why do you give him three names? Because they are not the same. Well, you told me there was one God, so which is it? Which is what? Which is the name of your God? I told you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm so confused. <laughs> well, you're right to be confused. This is getting really confusing. Um, why don't you sit down here on this stool that I have, and I'll try to explain it to you. Let's see. Um, okay, that was getting confusing. Let's see. Um, let's be honest. It's not easy to understand that there is one God in three persons. Hmm. There are lots of things about God that we don't understand. This is where faith comes in. Now, God asks us to believe even though we don't understand, right? So the Bible tells us that God is God the Father, He is God the Son, and He is God the Holy Spirit. Now confused, you're not the only one that has this problem. It's a little difficult to understand. 
So let me see, how can I, I know how I can explain it. Okay, I just happen to have something in here. This is my favorite ice cream. Neapolitan. Whoa, this is so good. Now, let me tell you. Look at this ice cream right here. Now, you have chocolate, you have vanilla, and you have strawberry, right? Well, there are three completely different flavors of ice cream in one bucket. Neapolitan. So, our God is only one God. In our God, we find the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know what we call this? We call it the Trinity. Trinity. Yes, the Trinity. Now, our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has existed forever. He even existed before anything happened. In fact, he created everything around you so we could see his glory and his power. You know, he even created you and me. Isn't that amazing? That amazing. I am just so amazed. God is so big and so powerful that we can never fully understand him. Okay, so you and I are going to go eat some ice cream here. You know, eat the ice cream with the three flavors. But can we pray for the one God first? Father, understandably you, that you are one God, but you are also three persons, and it's hard for us. Help us to have faith. Help us as we go through our day to know you better. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Can we have some ice cream now? After. After. Huh. How are you? It's Trinity Sunday. Yes, it's Father's Day also. And I think the women are working on something, right? Whenever it happens, it happens. The little trinket. We don't never know when you get your Father's Day little trinket, but you will. Happy Father's Day, happy Trinity Day. Before I start preaching, I want to thank everybody who was helping out the last couple of weeks. It was not four weeks, George, definitely not, that the pastor was gone. But we had some wonderful preachers, our certified lay minister, Gary and Brian and Gordon Smith, retired pastor, helping out. The pastor was working also, besides a little vacation. We went to conference. And it was a good conference, and I, what I said earlier, I wished you all would have been there. It's not a blah, blah meeting, but it was a lot of prayer, a lot of crying, a lot of candles, and a lot of wrestling with what is it? Who are we now in this time, in this year, as a global Methodist, united Methodist church? I want to share a little bit with it, of it, continuing what Rosanna already said in our sermon, and then we'll continue and have more details on Tuesday. Please mark your calendar if you are here, and if you have time, 4.30 on Tuesday, we'll have our round table. Here's the women in action. All right. There you go. So are you preaching now or I'm preaching? I'm not. Okay, I'm, I'm telling them that um, God dropped these crosses down for these fathers in here for you to put them in your pocket. And these crosses are going to be out here. And please take one, dads. We love you. You know, I called on my dad up there. I told him, get down here, dad. I need some help. 
And if it's not a physical dad with biological children, but if yes. it is a father figure, would they be able to take one with them and Please. put them in their pockets also? Please. Thank you very much. Take one. All right. On the way out, don't yeah. forget. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. So, we're sitting there, and we're listening to the first sermon of Bishop Swanson in Albuquerque. He was a bishop, or is the bishop, of the Mississippi Conference. African-American preaching, wonderful, powerful man. And he started sharing that story and said, you're allowed to take that with you, which we're doing right now. So him moving to a new place, Episcopal place, where he had a new parsonage, and he brought his family with him, and there was this baby daughter, he called her. She was probably 14 by the time they moved. And she was the first one going into that new house and checking out all the rooms and picking the one that she wanted to take. Actually, she picked two rooms because she was the baby daughter. She said, these are my rooms, and the brother who came a little bit later got the other room, and the parents let him go and say, oh, that's all right. If you all can handle it that way, that's the way it goes. It took about two weeks, and then the fight started. And little baby daughter wasn't happy anymore with her rooms because the air condition wouldn't work there as well as maybe in the other room. And she started getting mom on her side and said, Mom, you need to do something. We need to swap rooms and we need to do something different. And here it was. And the peace in this beautiful parsonage suddenly was gone. And Father Bishop Swanson said, as generous and as charming and as brilliant as he was as a leader and as the bishop of this area, he felt helpless. It got worse when his wife said, you need to do something. You're the leader. You're the role model. You're the father of this house. You need to step in. Oh, it's my baby girl. So he would go and part of this becoming the new bishop there was to go and have some life coaching, as we call that today. And a counselor was listening and said, you know, you can tell me anything. What's going on right now in your life? So he said, well, actually, everything is good, except for my baby girl. She's stirring up all that stuff in my house, and, and I'm getting in a fight with my wife because I thought they can handle it, and now we have this problem there, and there's no more peace anywhere. And she sat down with him, and she said to him, Listen, this is your girl, 14 years old, trying to grow up, trying to become the one who has her own voice and to go into a relationship struggling, wrestling with you as her dear, adored father, bishop, father. It would have happened anywhere, whether you have moved or not. She's there trying to find her voice and to wrestle and to struggle with you. I see some people nodding here. You went through this stuff, right? And he would answer and say, but she's my baby girl. She's still my baby. How can she just separate herself from me and trying to find to make her own point in this thing? We were sitting at the table at annual conference there was a lot of small table work together, and it was brilliant. So you're meeting people from other, you know, other congregations in the area. There's this lady sitting next to me, and she's from a small church somewhere out there in rural New Mexico. And she says, I'm done. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't have a father that I can adore. I don't even know how to cry like a baby girl and say, do something. I've lost it all, and my church doesn't even know who the Father is. And I did not, because I come from a place, from a culture, where the fathers were gone. They were left in the war, right? And you should see, there's these male figures in my country, home country, where I come from. Well, do you know how they celebrate Father's Day today? They're getting their beer wagons out and going on a hike, and you don't want to be on the trains tonight because it's awful. <laughs> Everybody's going to be drunk. That's not a good role model. Don't laugh. 
I'd rather have you wear that cross in your pocket there. The lady next to me at that table said, I feel like that. I feel like there's nobody who's telling me right now where I should go. She was desperate. And she said, I don't even know if our church knows right now, our United Methodist Church, New Mexico Conference, there is all these 400 people in the room. Do they know, do they know how to relate to the Father? As simple as it seems to get some ice cream and just, you know, brown, white, red, right? Do we know, do we have a father that we can relate to that will tell us the truth? Your former pastor, Randall Parton, he did that exciting thing. He put us all on the phone and you could vote on the phone on something and said, look, let's do the old Wesley questions together one more time and say, how is it with your soul? Do you remember that question? And we all had to click, uh, good, you know, and we got that little survey here. It was funny. You know Randall, right? And then the next question came. Is my heart where your heart is? The old question of Wesley. Are we all together? Do I trust you? Tip yes, no, or I'm not sure? And the results were, I don't want to spoil your Sunday this morning. 72% said, yes, my heart is where your heart is. We're talking across the conference, anywhere from Odessa, to down to Presidio and Las Cruces somewhere in the middle. And there were 42%, all right, this is a fast little poll that we did, who said, no, my heart is not where yours are. Of course, reflecting and reacting to what happened at General Conference. And I was crying. And 50%, all right, this doesn't get to 100%, I agree, right? Would say, I'm not certain. I'm not sure where we are right now. There was the woman who's sitting at the table and said, I don't even know if that church knows how to relate to the Father, Holy Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Got really quiet. And then she kind of got really loud and said, you know, I know Jesus, he gave us the example, and the whole John is full of the Father and I, the Father and I, you know, whatever the Father says, I do, whatever the Father will give us his will, we already have it there in our hearts. I said, I don't feel that connection, neither in my personal life, I don't have these role models, nor in the life of the church. You know church, how it looks like when you have a church, when you have a family, where there is no father the fatherless generations, where everybody's running around like little orphans and nobody knows where we're going. Where's the role? Where are we going from here? It's desperate. And she said, I am brave enough to question, to say, what if happened that Jesus knew his relationship and he was so close and so beautiful, father and son together, why did he not equip us better? so that we would go and be sovereign like that and say, we know what to do, you know, the Father and I are one, and we'll just take it from there. Why? Why did he kind of leave us alone? And then we come to John 16, the reading for today. Because Jesus, before he even gets crucified, look at your page again if you want to, he gives us a hint. He's telling his disciples who went through this class with him now forever and saying, I first have to go and I can't tell you the things that are going to happen now because you're not ready to bear them yet. You're not ready physically. The word for in Greek is here to bear, to hold them, to carry them. They don't make sense for you right now. You need to wait. First, I have to get crucified. Then I have to empty the tombs and turn the whole craziness of destruction upside down. Easter. Then I have to ascend to the Father. That's what we had, ascension. And then I will send you my deputy, my substitute, my advocate, the Holy Spirit, Pentecost last Sunday, so that he will teach you everything in due time, when you're ready for it, when you have the right questions, when you're growing up like a teenage girl, which room do I be in? Do I want this one? Do I want this one? Where is my father? Jesus is giving us clear instructions that it's all planned out. You need to wait. This is where we are, church. This is where we are, that you 
can't have it ahead of time. It's one of the biggest struggles for me coming from the culture where I come. I want to have it planned out. I want to have the security in place before it is. I want to have the father just walking along with me and telling me right there, oh, then this is going to happen, and this is what we're going to do, and then this is going to happen, and I have it planned out to look like this. We don't. I will not give you all that right now, but you will wait. And when the Holy Spirit comes, then he will instruct you in all these things that you need to know at that time. Perfect timing. You've been there a hundred times, haven't you? I didn't know how to do it. And suddenly it was clear. Jesus is very clear in John 16, very briefly, but it's important to tell us the functions of the Holy Spirit. Number one. He will lead you on the way. Hodos agios. So he will lead the way. It's like he's rolling up that carpet while we walk on it. Can you see that? It's not like giving instructions, then you go over there and then left and then right. It's not going to work. We're not listening. But he will lead you, walk along with you on that way. I have to tell you a quick confession. One of my biggest fights with my other beloved dear half, George Miller. We had two days before conference started. Okay, I took a vacation there. When you're up in Albuquerque, you go a little bit to the north and the west. So we went to the Chaco Monument. Beautiful New Mexico. I mean, nothing is as beautiful as Las Cruces, but this was awesome. So you look at the Native American buildings and the monuments there, and it was sunset, and it was romantic, and we had all the time in the world, and we said, how are we going to get out of there now, you know? And George Miller, brilliant man, says, well, we can take the other road, right? The other road. The road we came in was already horrible enough. They call it a road without pavement, right? <laughs> yeah, this thing, yeah. So we took the other road because it would be faster to get to the other side. And stupid as I am, I listen to him because he's the father, right? He's the American in here. Oh, don't talk to him about it, right? I kept my mouth shut in the end. We got there. But the, why I wanted to share it with you this morning is I was driving at one time because we had to switch drivers back and forth, trying not to, you know, get a flat tire. There's nobody there. And suddenly, at the end of the horizon, I see a car in front of us. I've never thought the view of another car looks more beautiful than that. If that car will maybe make it, this is an hour later after we left the National Park, right? Maybe we will do it. This is the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit will lead you. Walk, lead you the path ahead of you, right there, so that you can see it a little bit. You need to catch up, not too close, right? But then it'll get there. We got there that night. We even found a motel, okay? Number two. The Holy Spirit will not only lead you, but he will proclaim the news in good, in due time. At that time, always fresh, always perfect, so that you will know right then what to say. In John 16, in our passage for today, there's nothing about prophecy, about, well, and this is going to happen, and then it's going to look like that, but he will give you the answer of what the gospel means at that time for your perfect life. He will give you the answer to say, this is what the Father will tell you right now. He makes the connection for you. The one that all these fatherless children don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm going. He will give you the answer so that you are suddenly in contact with Father through the Holy Spirit being taught on your earthly area, Chaco Monument, Northwest, New Mexico, or wherever you are right now. That's comforting. I see that lady sitting at my table still, struggling. And suddenly there was this opening. We didn't go through John 16. She said, if there was a spirit that will make that contact for me with the Father again, to teach me, to whisper in my ear, there is no father that has abandoned you. I don't know which families you come from, whether you had that brilliant father who was always there, who you would call up when your car broke down and he would say, honey, I'll be right there and I'll pick it up and you take my car, air conditioned, and I'll wait in the sun, or whether you haven't. 
But there is this Holy Spirit who suddenly will tell you, you're not alone, you're not abandoned. You're a saint in the making. You're a child of God who has the Father who's always been watching over you. Do you remember what you sang a couple minutes ago? Faith God. You know how this go? From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. What's that? And it goes on and on. Listen to the words that you were singing. I see that lady sitting next to me in her little, little church in rural New Mexico. She said, maybe, maybe there's someone telling us where to go individually. Maybe I get a sense of whether I had a good father or not of a father in heaven who cared about me enough to send his son to make contact with me, to come back up to me and send me the Holy Spirit so that I get the answer for today. Our bishop, Bishop Letso, he said, if there is one conference in that whole United Methodist Church, maybe in North America, that can bear and do something after general conference with all the destruction and what's going on right now, who can carry it, it will be New Mexico. And then there was this running joke. He said, you know why New Mexico? And he's, you know, he's Northwest Texas Bishop and New Mexico Bishop. You know why New Mexico? He said, number one is because you guys know how to love each other. It's easy because you're so glad, you're so far apart that when you go from one to B and you get to see another face, you're so glad you have to love them, right? You can't be rely on each other. And number two is because you don't want anything what the other person has in New Mexico, right? You just together. But he said number three, the most important about it is you all went through some stuff already in history, in politics, wherever you were. New Mexico knows what they're talking about, right? So if you want to love and learn how to be a father-driven, led church again. It would be New Mexico. And now we're here, trying to figure out how we get to that Napoleon, Neapolitanian, whatever, <laughs> ice cream. Pick up your bulletin for a minute. There's no ice cream advertisement in there, sorry. No Ben's and Jerry's coupon either. But there is an icon, a picture of an icon in there. It's Rublev, 12th century Orthodox Christianity. I think next to the bulletin where you find it. Did you see it? And you see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sitting there. When Rublev in near Moscow was portraying, was praying through that it's iconography. He was portraying the story of the three men visiting Abraham and Mambre. Do you remember? When they would come and Sarah was there on the side and she was listening in through the tent and they say, oh, by the way, Abraham, you're going to have a son? And Sarah started laughing. That's that story. It's been the picture for us in our Christianity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sitting there. And you see there is a fourth side, right? That's you and I. We're part on that table. We're sharing around that cup, the bread. There is a Father in heaven sitting together with the Son, watching every step of his church, and of us individually to see, can you feel it? Can you see it, how much I love you? Praying through it. And the Holy Spirit making it possible in the midst of it to say, now I teach you for this moment how to adore the Father and obey Him and to copy the brother. And you'll be part of a beautiful family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all day long, all night long, worshiping, celebrating together with you, no matter what you're in, for that day, for today, 16th of June, and tomorrow again. And you'll be part of it. 
and that nobody in the whole conference and nobody in Las Cruces and nobody of our church will go out there anymore and say, I don't have a father, I don't have any contact with anybody. He's right there with you. The brother is right there with you and said, I will teach you. And the Holy Spirit is working through you and say, listen up, now left, now right, now come home and sit at my table. How dare we walk around sometimes like we don't have a real family. They're right there. They're with us every day. And now comes the beautiful part of it. So we can go out and with whatever we do, whether we work in the garden or we work in our workplaces or we tend to our families, to our children, grandchildren, we can say, come. You know what's the best about a good family? You always can bring a stranger, right? For dinner, I bring someone along. That's our church. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working with us and saying, don't you walk anymore around like you're a little orphan and you don't have a role model, a father who's challenging you, who's supporting you, who's loving you to death, and who will walk with you if you are a revolting 15-year-old child sitting there fighting for a room. I want this room now, God. Or whether you are maturing in this love, walking along with you and say, and he will call you out and say, you'll always be, always be my baby girl, my church. You'll always be my baby son, my baby daughter, you individuals, brothers and sisters of this church. And so we go forward from this day. I want you to be in prayer for all these churches who are not sure where they are right now in our conference. I want you to teach them. I had my mouth full there. I walked through Albuquerque through that conference and giving them example. Let me tell you what we do at our church. Not we, what you all do. We're already there how we can love and how we can reach out, how we can be in mission in the middle of challenges and struggles so that everybody out there, it's not fake. They can see it, they can feel it and say they're unique in our families as we go through struggles and he'll always walk along with us. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know that there are churches who are struggling. We know that there are individuals who feel like, I wish I had a father who would be there for me. I wish I would have had a strong, intact family that I can just put my feet up and sit there at the table and say, let us laugh together and let me just put my, my slippers on. You're here, God. You've always been there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equipping us for this moment in our time so that we will find our way home, that we know that the light is always on and that you will walk with us. You visit us at the places that are new and challenging for us. And you've already been there where we think this is new and this is a territory I do not want to cover. You teach us how to love how to be your children in the making more and more, to trust and be proud and to give you the honor for the way we carry ourselves as being part of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we pray for our neighbor churches, for everybody out there who's struggling. And we want to pass it on that peace and the faith and that glory that you give us so we have now peace with God, sharing of his grace, and are taking part in his glory. In your name we pray. Amen.